All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Genomics Light. This is the fourth in our Infectious Diseases series, and today we are doing a careers panel to celebrate the International Day of Girls and Women in STEM. So we've joined by four lovely researchers from the Welcome Genome Campus, who will each be telling us a little bit about their career, the work that they do, um, and giving you an opportunity to ask them any questions you might have about their route into science. So whether that's what uni they went to or what skills they learned along the way, you'll have a chance to hear and ask those sorts of questions as we go. Um, in case anyone has not used a Zoom webinar before, um, you'll notice that you can't use your camera or microphone today. So instead, if you need to get in contact with us, you can use the chat box, um, which will give you the opportunity to ask any questions. And if you've got any technical issues, you can let us know there. Um, there's also a Q&A box that should be at the bottom that looks like two little speech bubbles. If you've got any specific questions for our panelists, uh, it's really useful if you can pop them in the Q&A uh, box. It just makes it slightly easy, easier for us to find your questions later. Um, I know if you're on mobile, sometimes it's hard to find the Q&A. So if you can't find it, just use the chat box. That's absolutely fine. Someone's just asked whether this was uh, this session was specifically meant for females. No, it's meant for everybody. Uh, we're just celebrating International Day of Girls and Women in STEM, but everybody is welcome uh, to join us for this session. Before I pass over to our speakers, um, I will let them introduce themselves really quickly, and then I will do a little introduction about the campus in case anyone hasn't uh, come across our work before. So, uh, Leah, do you want to just give us give a really quick introduction to who you are? Hello, um, I'm Leah and I'm a molecular biologist. I'm currently a postdoc. I'm based at Sanger. Wonderful. Hannah, do you want to say a quick hello? Hi, my name's Hannah and I'm a postdoc at Embel EBI. Wonderful. Uh, Harriet? Hi, everyone. My name is Harriet. Um, I'm a software developer at Welcome Trust Sanger Institute. And Buggy. Hi, I'm Birgit and I'm a molecular biologist and currently a curator at Emil EBI. Wonderful. So you'll hear obviously more from them in just a second. Um, but I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to the campus uh, as an overview of what we do, and then I'll pass back over to them. So I will share my screen very quickly. So this is the campus. Uh, we're based just outside of Cambridge um, and we have lots of different science happening on the campus, um, but there's two main research institutes um, there. Oh, uh, that's on the next slide. Um, uh, I'll just see if you can all find the chat for me and let us know where in the world you are joining us from. So the campus is based just outside of Cambridge. Um, I'm actually still living in Scotland up here. So I always like to see if anyone is further away from campus than I am. So. If you can find the chat box, um, let us know where in the world you're joining us from and we'll see who is furthest away. Lots from Cambridge, a couple from London. Russia, that's, that's, a, that's I think a new one for us. So welcome, welcome from Russia. Someone quite close to campus. Um, quite a UK mix today. So we've got quite a lot from Essex and Cambridge. I think our uh, Russian attendee is so far the, the furthest, uh, Netherlands as well. Awesome. So we've got quite a good mix of people from all over the world, um, which is really lovely. And our staff as well come from all over the world as well. On the campus, then we've got our two main research institutes. Uh, we have the Welcome Sanger Institute and we have Embel EBI. Um, our panelists today, uh, we've got a mix from, from both. So you'll hear a little bit more about each research institute in a second. But both are interested in genomics. That's why genomes in our campus name. And genomics is the study of the genome, which we can uh, think about as an organism's complete set of genetic information. So we're looking at whole genomes, um, all the genetic information in different species to understand and more about uh, biology and health. Um, we've got different sort of topics that we research on campus, um, human genetics, cancer, cellular genetics, uh, bio, uh, biodiversity and evolution. Um, and today our topic sort of fits within uh, parasites and microbes as all of our speakers have at some point researched something to do with infectious diseases. Before I hand over to our speakers then, um, I'll just point you towards some resources that might be particularly useful if you're in A-level or GCSE and looking to learn a bit more about genomics. Um, we have our Your Genome website where we've got lots of activities, uh, information, videos about everything to do with genomics. 
You can sign up for our education update. Uh, this is the last in this series of Genomics Light, but we'll be launching a new series in March. So if you sign up for our education update, uh, you'll find out when those go live um, and you can email us or get in contact, contact with us on social media as well. I'll pop all these links in the chat box in just a second. I think that was everything that I was gonna uh, share before I hand over to our speaker. So I'll stop sharing just then. And I think Leah is up first. So Leah, if you're ready, I'll pass over to you. Great, so um, my name is Leah. Um, so I said earlier, I'm a molecular biologist. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that when I sort of talk about what I do now, but just as a kind of one line intro, it's the kind of bit of biology, which is often involved in sticking bits of DNA together and figuring out what they mean and how to make them work. Um, so I'm gonna be kind of slightly conventional and I'll just kind of tell you my kind of science career. I'll do it chronologically, seemed a good as way as any. Um, so you can probably tell from my accent that I'm from the UK. Um, so I grew up in Oxfordshire, which is a couple of hours drive from where I work now in Cambridgeshire. Um, so I grew up in a small town, which has got nothing very exciting going on in it and um, very little science at all. Um, I didn't uh, went to uh, the local kind of comprehensive school and I just did a boring selection of A levels. So unsurprisingly, I did biology. Um, which I guess pretty much everyone might expect. I've also done like chem uh, chemistry, which is useful. The thing which might be less obviously useful if you're thinking about being a biologist in the long run is that I found some of the most useful bits of A-level I did were actually the maths and the physics. Um, because I didn't really do as much of those later at degree, I still find myself using some of the skills I learned in A-levels now. Um, so if any of you folks are interested in sort of staying in science, um, I'd say you can carry on with as much maths or physics as you can um, it's actually surprisingly useful later on um, so yeah I did uh, A levels at school kind of enjoyed the practical side of it and thought oh that'd be cool I'll try and be a scientist um, I thought I wanted to be a biologist I actually was really excited about DNA stuff because around the time I was doing my A levels was the 50th anniversary of the structure of DNA being found so like the double helix picture was everywhere at the time I was like oh what kind of scientist should I be um, so I thought, oh, DNA, that sounds cool. Go and, go and do some of that. So um, looking that up and talking to some of my teachers, the most obvious kind of degree for the bits of biology that I was interested in was biochemistry or molecular biology. Um, so I had a look at various bits of uh, ways of doing that. And the most obvious thing to do seemed to be to go and do a degree in that. So that seemed to be a, a good thing to do. So that's what I kind of looked into. One thing that kind of really pushed me into thinking, actually, I could maybe actually do some science was an experience I had in the middle of my A-levels where I did what's called a, a Nuffield placement. So um, I'd encourage anyone who's kind of interested in maybe seeing what science is really like to kind of look this up. Um, a host lab um, let me come and do a project there for six weeks during the summer holidays between like what was AS and A2 then. Um, so I got to hang out with a load of biologists and kind of chat to them and understand a bit more about what they did. Um, the other thing about that story is I can tell it like that and it sounds kind of kind of normal, but the, the other way I can tell that story is that I spent a whole summer um, ripping the testicles out of fruit flies. So I'm not quite sure how that fits in with today's theme, but um, it's not a very useful party trick unless you're at a fruit fly um, kind of conference. But anyway, so that was a side story from that over. Um, so I did sort of A-levels. I did UCAS form, the same kind of stuff that you guys are probably do now. Um, probably will have changed slightly. Um, but I guess the thing I would say is that look into what the degree modules are as well as the content. So the degree biochemistry is actually really different, loads of different unis. I wasn't really that interested in doing like too much of the chemistry side, um, a bit, but not too much. Uh, but I'd wanted to do some. So that really kind of varied across different unis. And what I really didn't want to do was ecology, which is like counting stuff in fields as I thought at the time. Um, so I avoided degrees that had that in it. Um, but yeah, I have colleagues now and friends now whose degrees are all the same name, but what we actually did was kind of quite different. Um, I also picked a degree where we had modules in our first year and we didn't have to choose what we specialised in until later on. Um, so I'd have a look and, you know, I think there's maybe half a dozen different unis in the UK offer that kind of thing. Um, some of it will be joint honours, some of it will be different names, but that way I could put off, I could have a go at a bit more subjects before I picked which one I went with. So I went with biochemistry in the end and I had a great time at uni. The things I really liked about the course I did was how much practical work there was, which meant I got to really um, have a go and like 
by the time I got later on, I'd had plenty of time in the lab. And in fact, we got to do a long research project in our final year. And again, the best bit about that was I got to hang out with a bunch of scientists who'd been doing this for a while, kind of really understand which bits I liked, which bits I didn't like. Um, and I think that really kind of helped uh, later on. I've also got stories about where they helped, like we worked with radioactive RNA, which is sounds way cooler than it actually was. I actually meant you had to be really careful with health and safety, but um, some of the most important skills I learned about how to be careful in RNA came from that time and about me learning that if you didn't screw the top on properly, you have to spend the whole day cleaning the centrifuge till it was totally clean with the Geiger counter. So that, yeah, those hands-on skills were really great. Uh, the other thing about being at uni is that sometimes you get a chance to do summer projects over the summer holidays. And actually, I think like looking back at it now, those short projects where I went to work in a lab for kind of six, eight weeks were really useful for some of the, the things I learned to later on. It's actually how I ended up at Sanger, to be honest. Um, one summer, I ended up doing a summer job where we were looking at um, bacterial genomes and we had to look up papers and annotate on the bacterial genome, whether there was a paper about it and whether it wasn't. Um, and that's kind of how I ended up where I am now, to be honest, just by following a random summer job. So I think, yeah, during my degree, I did a bunch of summer jobs. And then like my final year, I was like, actually, I really like this science thing. How do I do this full time? Can I actually manage to get paid for this rather than just doing a degree? Um, turns out um, it's not super obvious, but most PhD programs pay you. Um, you don't have to pay tax usually. So by the time you add on the tax, you don't pay. It works out roughly similar to a starting graduate job. Like not totally the same. You can, you can look at the numbers more closely, but um, at the end of the day, I ended up with roughly the same amount of money in my pocket as my friends that were doing sort of graduate jobs when we left. Um, so I chose to do my PhD at the Sanger Institute. So I've actually been at Sanger Institute a while. Um, the thing I really liked about uh, Sanger is all the excitement about DNA stuff everywhere, which yeah, I'm still excited now. So it's probably a good place to admit. Um, but the thing about that PhD program, again, the thing I liked about that is that we got to do short projects before we picked our favorite. So we got to go into three different labs. I came to Sanger wanting to work on model organisms. So that's things like fruit flies, uh, they had zebra fish at the time. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna work on a really boring lab pet. And just, you know, cause those are the only things you can actually do any real genomics on. Um, but actually it turns out um, there's, you can do genomics on other organisms. So that's how I accidentally stumbled into working on malaria parasites. Um, so that's yeah, how I'm an inf accidentally an infectious disease researcher. So my PhD project was trying to make a technology called RNA-seq work for malaria parasites. This could be like a three hour talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll get shut up before then, but in like a line, the point of RNA-seq is to use a DNA sequencing machine to measure which genes are on when um, for different par different times in the parasite's life cycle. Um, because the malaria genome is weird, that turns out to be technically hard. So it took ages for it to work, but when it did, it was super satisfying. And during that project, I learned to get good at all the molecular biology technology, which is good for getting sequencing to work, which how is I accidentally ended up in the job I got next, which is to work in the R&D division of Sanger. So that was not working with parasites, but I learned a lot about how you do stuff at huge scale. Um, some of you folks might have seen in the news about how Sang is doing loads and loads of COVID genome in kind of like a factory sequencing style. So I learned a lot about how to do things reproducibly, how to do things um, so they come out the same every time. So that's super useful for like cake recipes at home as well as my day-to-day -day science. And then just to finish up, um, the job I have now is a postdoc. So I decided that after having worked in the part of Sanger, which does the large scale stuff, I wanted to go back into the technology that doesn't work. So my job is stuff to make stuff from a protocol that never works and to that kind of we drawn on a piece of paper to something that works at least some of the time. So it's about measuring a molecule called RNA from individual cells. And the point of the tech I work on is to get this, to do it on thousands of cells and to do it super cheaply and to do it so it works most of the time. Um, some of the time it works um, and you know, the kind of fun part is figuring out where it could work better. And I'm hoping that in the next kind of year or so, I can actually move back and do some projects with malaria parasites again, working with some folks at Sanger. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say about that. I'm happy to answer some questions later, um, but just kind of one quick comment from me about um, is that you, the nice thing about science is you get to move around a lot. So you might hear some folks later on talking about that a bit. 
Um, it's cool to meet loads of people from different countries and different places with different skill sets. But I just wanted to throw in the curveball that I actually decided to stay roughly in the UK so that I could be in reach of family when my dad was ill. So like if all this stuff about having, you know, being having to over the world kind of puts you off, you, you can do it another way too. Um, there's loads of different ways of doing science. So some of them are moving around countries every three years, but there's more than one way of doing it. So yeah, that's it for me. Um, happy to tell you about any of those uh, the things like the fruit fly dissections later. Awesome, thanks Leah. Um, we just got a couple of sort of very specific questions for you that I'll get you to answer just now before we move on. Um, so one person asked um, what university you went to and whether you had any other recommendations for like good universities for biochemistry specifically. Oh, so I did my um, uh, undergrad degree at Cambridge. Um, other universities are available. There's loads of good. I would just say, look for one that gives you loads of hands-on time. Um, I said, that's, that's the big thing. Some universities, you'll get one hour of practicals a month. Um, one where you have plenty of hands-on time in the labs and plenty of hands-on time with tutors is probably your best bet. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, we will move on to our next speaker, which I believe is Hannah. Yes, hello. I will share my screen. Um, thank you everyone for listening to me speak. Um, my name is Hannah and uh, I have the same drama as Leah in many aspects. I'm also a postdoc researcher um, at the European Bioinformatics Institute. So um, I focus on bioinformatics, which is the use of computer science and data science to help answer biological problems. In particular for me, I'm interested in human genetics. So at the moment, I'm working on COVID um, in response to the pandemic, trying to help find uh, how certain genetics might influence how severe people get the disease. Um, and if hopefully we find something, uh, this might help us think about diagnosing the disease efficiently, um, coming up with good possible medicines and drugs uh, to help combat the disease uh, and also just better understand, the better we understand it, the easier it is to help solve the problem. Um, but prior to this, uh, my general more broad focus and interest in terms of research is using clinical data, so data that is collected when you go to a hospital or the doctors, um, in particular medical imaging, so MRIs and ultrasounds, to help understand um, human traits better and then understand the genetics behind the traits. So um, one of my research projects was to look at the human retina. Here's a nice scan of the human retina and understand the genetics of the human retina, um, which helps us understand retinal disease better uh, and think about how we can diagnose retinal disease better. So a wee bit of background on how I got to this current job. Um, in high school, uh, I actually like, I knew I was always into science, but I also liked a lot of other subjects. So um, I was very happy that my high school offered the International Baccalaureate, which meant that I could keep studying six subjects uh, to in sort of like the A-level age. So I studied biology, chemistry and math at the higher level. So that was my speciality at high school. But I also got to continue studying geography, Spanish and English, which I loved to read. Um, I like to travel and I really wanted to keep going with the language. So that was a great opportunity for me. Um, and then as I left high school, I was very certain that I wanted to be a marine biologist. I was very, very interested in penguins. I really liked stingrays and sharks and was certain that my life was gonna be on a beautiful yacht, sailing the seas, looking at these lovely animals. <laughs> so I um, applied to and got into the University of St. Andrews. And part of the reason I chose this was because it was right by the, it was right by the sea, perfect place to go and study these animals. Um, it also just appealed to me and it was slightly smaller and I grew up in a village and wasn't sure that I was quite ready yet for big city life. So it was the perfect place for me for then. Um, but as uh, similarly to Leah, um, in my first couple of years, I got to study quite broadly, which turned out to be very useful for me because I soon came to realize that as much as I was interested in the animals more broadly, when I got down to it, I was way more interested in their cells and their DNA than maybe their behavior or something, which is maybe something you'd uh, explore more in marine biology. So I decided to transfer to molecular biology um, with a focus on genetics. At the same time during uni, 
I also uh, had friends that were studying computer science. It was nothing that I'd ever considered. No one had ever really shown me what it was about. And um, it just really appealed to me. It was very problem solving, puzzly, logic. Um, and that really appealed to me. So in my spare time, I decided to teach myself to code using some online resources. And I, in doing so, I discovered that there was this field called bioinformatics that would combine my real love of biology with the skills that computer science um, gives you. Uh, and this is called bioinformatics. And to try and develop that and be able to apply these new coding skills to biological problems, I did internships in my summers at different universities. Um, and this was great. It uh, really exposed me to a broader scientific community. Uh, it gave me the opportunity to work on my own more like longer research projects. Uh, and it was, it was generally a great opportunity to apply what I had been learning on my own to real world science. Uh, and so I graduated with a degree in molecular biology and this real interest in bioinformatics. And similarly to Leah again, um, I went on to do my PhD um, about at the EBI, so focusing on bioinformatics. And as I just showed you, um, my PhD focused on the genetics of the human retina, looking at uh, the retina using different clinical imaging techniques, which was really good. Um, generally about my career, um, the reason that I really love my job, for some of the reasons that you can see on the screen, um, so one of the main things I love is that it's an opportunity to continually learn. So I feel like I'm constantly learning new things, which is something I love, um, getting to try new science. Uh, during my PhD, I got to go to Grenoble, which is the picture in the top left in the big bubble, um, to see this huge piece of machinery that helps you understand the structure of proteins. It was honestly, it was the size of an arena. It was crazy. And it was something that I had never gotten seen before. Um, and that was amazing. I learned something new. I also got to try looking at chicken embryos through a microscope um, using these microscopes um, able to see tiny things in like incredible detail. Um, and so, yeah, I've just had the opportunity to continually grow my skills, try new things, understand new parts of biology. Um, also, I feel like I'm part of a really big community of scientists. This has involved things like organizing conferences with fellow students where I get to speak to other scientists about things that interest me. Um, I'm also part of public engagement, so I get to talk to the general public about my research and about science more broadly. Um, for me, this means helping teach young people to code and introducing them to computer science, um, hoping that maybe they're also interested in it like I am. Um, through all of this, I've also got to meet new people all the time. Um, it's a really friendly environment generally. Um, and so here I am with all my fellow PhD students, getting to meet people from all around the world. Um, and also at the moment, something I'm incredibly grateful for um, is that it's a really flexible job. So I'm incredibly thankful that I've been able to keep doing my research during the pandemic. Um, but even prior to that, there was flexibility as to where I could work and how I could work. And I also really like the prospect of being able to potentially work abroad sometime um, and try new things and try new places. Um, that's kind of all I've prepared. So if anyone has any questions about that, that would be grand. Awesome, thank you very much, Hannah. There's two questions that I think are particularly sort of uh, useful for you to answer. So someone says, do you need to do a master's to do a PhD? Um, and I think I know uh, your, your route enough to, <laughs> to get you to answer this one. Yes, no. So in the UK, there is no requirement to have done a master's to do a PhD. Some people um, would prefer to do that. Uh, I personally decided to go straight to the PhD. I think part of that was enabled because I had quite a lot of experience because of the summer internships I did during my undergrad. Um, and some people instead decided to take a master's to get that uh, like hands-on experience, but it's not a requirement at all. It's just about a preference. So it's more about the experience and that some people get that through a master's, but some people get it through other things. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Um, and there was one more that I think uh, Harriet's gonna cover a little bit as well, but um, ask you as well. So someone's asked uh, you, Hannah, what websites you, or resources you use to teach yourself code? 
So um, I used a website called Code Academy when I was learning uh, at university. Uh, there are now a lot more resources I think available than when I first started learning. So I would like to recommend one called Code Dojo um, and also the Raspberry Pi Foundation also do great work in terms of teaching people to code from scratch. But there's lots of free resources online. I recommend looking up on YouTube. I've learned a lot of things about coding from just watching YouTube videos as well. Awesome, and I think Harriet's gonna recommend some more in a little bit, um, but that one was specifically directed at you. Awesome, in that case, thank you very much, Hannah, and we will move on to Harriet. Hi, everyone. So hopefully you can see my screen. Is that all okay? Great. And um, so, yeah, hopefully this will carry on quite nicely from Hannah, because I'm gonna talk to you about coding and software development. So I'm a software developer. Um, and I work at Sanger. So I'm going to talk to you about how my career is going so far. <laughs> so I work at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, who are contributing to the sequencing and analysis of COVID-19. Um, I work in a team of 10 software developers where we build LIM systems. Um, these LIM systems um, stand for Laboratory Informatic Information Management Systems. And um, they enable tracking of these COVID-19 samples, which have have to come on site and then be moved from various, various different locations from freezers to labs before they finally get sequenced oh, yeah. um, and then stored off or disposed. Yeah. Sorry, um, your audio is a little bit uh, glitchy. If you could just pop on your pop off your camera, that might help your um, audio a little bit. Sure. Let's, let's try again. <laughs> so the LIM systems um, then also handle the collection of all this data as the samples go through many different processes to get them ready for sequencing. Um, and then this data is stored in huge databases on campus ready for analysis. Um, so after they've been sequenced, all this data gets stored in the database and then a separate team will then analyze the data and hopefully find new variants of the, of the COVID-19. So to rewind about 10 years, um, I'll talk you through how I got here. And when I was 16, I never in a million years imagined that I would be a software developer contributing specifically to scientific research. Uh, this is because I knew nothing about science. I didn't do, I didn't do chemistry. I did physics GCSE. I didn't do biology. And I left high school after 16, year, 16 years old leaving to go to a professional dance school in Chester. Slightly alternative. Um, so yeah, I love school and um, particularly art, textiles, sport and geography. But yeah, I wouldn't have been able to tell you the first thing about coding or science for that matter. Um, so three years at dance school and um, after three years, I graduated with a professional diploma in dance and um, with maths and English A-levels. Um, I then moved to London and started auditioning for different dance companies, contemporary dance companies, cruise ships and other shows when I became curious about what other careers and opportunities there might be out there. I had a few different jobs including tailoring costumes for a show and um, you know waitressing, assisting a designer so a few different few different roles but then one day I came home and saw my flatmate was building a piece of software in his building and um, across the across the hall and something to do with modeling the solar system and um, he had a few monitors on his desk uh, one with loads of code and then his other one was showing this model and I was completely mesmerized and I'd just never seen anything like it before so I remember going home and speaking to my parents slightly nervous to tell them that I didn't want to become a dancer and um, but that there was this thing called coding which I just knew the word of, didn't know much more about it, but I just knew I liked the sound of it. And my flatmate pointed me towards some different learning resources. And then I started to learn. A few months later, I applied for a programming school in London called Makers Academy. It was um, a really intense three months um, and I learned enough to apply for a junior software developer role at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute and I moved to Cambridge around five years ago. One year in, um, about four years ago, I started an open university degree in computing and IT. Um, I recognise this is 
definitely not your typical path um, to begin your first professional role having not got a degree or equivalent experience in any related topic but um, it did work for me and I feel like now I learn so much on the job as I often am able to apply what I learned with uni directly into my role on a daily basis. Um, and then last year I got promoted to senior software developer and um, this was I think definitely helped by my learning through the computer science degree but studying and working at the same time is, is hard it takes commitment and you know dedication to balance both of these but I think it's a brilliant way to learn and I would encourage you actually to look for digital apprenticeships in subjects that you are interested in especially if you're not sure whether full-time university is for you. I'm also enjoying, enjoying doing lots of public engagement at Sanger, which gives me you know, opportunities to try and encourage as many people, young girls, such as now, to pursue coding. So what is coding? To go back to what Hannah started to explain, um, software development involves coding and programming in lots of different languages, such, such as Python and Java, to build software applications and infrastructure. So I spend most of my day looking at these three things. The terminal is on the top right. This allows you to control your computer using commands. Um, on the left is a code editor. This is some code I was writing the other day. It looks maybe a little intimidating, but you know, once you get the hang of it, it's just like reading a book. There's chapters and there's pages and there's sentences and there's full stops and different syntaxes. Um, and then you run your code in the browser on the bottom right. But um, the rest of the time, I'm definitely Googling how to do something or asking somebody for help in the team. So yeah, it can look a little intimidating, but it's probably the back black background which you can change. Um, I find coding is similar to building anything. You start with small pieces and they gradually get put together until you have one big piece of software and then lots of software pieces get fitted together using networking tools. But developers write tests to make sure that everything they are coding does what they expect it to do, which helps remove any element of error. Um, but errors are fine as well. We call them bugs. You just you learn from them. But some common traits of coders or software developers, I think, is creativity, especially with building stuff all the time. And you have to think out of the box quite a lot of the time, which really fits for me because I'm quite a creative person. Um, teamwork, definitely, because no software is built by a single person. Um, we often pair program, which is when two people work together on the same piece of code. Curiosity is crucial because problem solving can be quite testing for your patients. Um, it's computer based, which means you can work from home or work from the office. It's quite flexible in that sense. Um, but you do naturally have to spend your time looking at a screen. And communication, I think, is underrated because the first thing we do as a team is talk to each other and tell them what we're working on and what problems we have. And um, yeah, if you're if you're building stuff, you have to be able to communicate and share your problems. But every day feels rewarding. And finally, learning, I think, is probably the most important. You have to keep learning to keep up to date with different technologies and programming languages um, and researching other people's code. And of course, some programming skills would help. <laughs> but coding is not just my job at, the sci at a scientific research institute, and nor is it just for gaming. I just want to um, say that because despite what people think, gaming is the first thing that often comes to mind when you say a coder. So coding is definitely in every type of career. I would encourage you, whatever your subjects are that you're currently studying or interested in, to think about where tech is used in that subject and where you might be able to encompass some tech into your projects possibly. And um, for example, Claire Dane's dress at the top left had coding in it to light up at the Met Gala and all maps use geocode so phones can give you directions and know your location. And um, sporting performances are always enhanced by using different coding algorithms. Um, for example, working out the possession of a ball during a football game or VAR um, and finance, online banking apps, fintech is a massively sought after field of software development. And of course, you've got your, you know, your cool robots and your rockets and your planes. That's all got a lot of um, software development behind the engineering. 
But my point is, even if you don't want to do computer science, do you say you are A-level or become a coder? I hope this shows coding skills are applicable and that they can be applicable to all of your other subjects in any career you go into. So yeah, there's lots of pros if you do like the sound of being a software development software developer. Um, it's a lot and it's really in demand. The, there's definitely more of a demand and supply of software developers. So we're quite sought after. And this is only going to continue, especially as tech is a massive driver, you know, during a pandemic, families have never relied upon social technology so much to keep in contact. 11% um, of the workforce are female. So it'd be great to see this change. Um, salaries are on the higher end as it tends to start around £20,000 as a junior software developer and then Amazons will be paying huge bucks, like three bigger things. Um, but yeah, I found I find coding so interesting. It's the perfect balance of mathematical, logical problems solv solving with creativity and you're always learning. Um, but just to stress, there's other tech related jobs that don't involve coding, for example, designing websites. Imagine if you went on a website and the login button wasn't at the top screen and the logo wasn't at the top left um, as attractive and usable as possible that don't involve coding and um, especially accessible people for people with disabilities and showing that they have an equally positive experience on a website. So yeah, there's lots of roles underneath the technical umbrella. And if you're interested during lockdown these are some resources i would suggest if you wanted to have a play with coding um hour of code is some quick fun activities scratch uses a coding block language which is a great place to start if you haven't done any coding before as does microbit which is a little chip in the bottom right corner and um, tech in the lab has some activities using the microbit that can show how tech is useful in the labs at Sanger and the colorful lily pad on the left is really cool. You code it and um, you can sew it into your clothes or any textiles. And um, like the trainers that stamp when you, when they flash when you stamp um, and code, code club and code dojo are both clubs that you can join, but they might be on pause at the moment. I think Hannah mentioned them before. So yeah, I hope this is giving you some insight into my slightly alternative career path um, and that you've learned a bit about software development along the way. Awesome. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, there were quite a few questions about like resources, but I think you've answered that perfectly. Um, and I have popped all of the links that Harriet talked about in the chat box. If you want to go and explore any of those resources, um, they'll all be available there um, and I'll stick it in the email that you'll get tomorrow as a follow-up from this webinar. So don't worry about clicking on them all now, you'll get them tomorrow as well. Um, one quick question for you, Harriet, before we uh, move on. Someone asked a very sort of practical question. Uh, how many hours in a day do you tend to work? It's a really good question, actually. Um, I got asked it in an interview, so really good question. Um, I when you think about it, you're working the eight hour day, I think it is. Um, but by the time you've done your stand up and spoke to the different team about what the plans are and you've spoke to your customers, so you're trying to figure out requirements. And then also a lot of hours go on to Googling how to do something. So I think I would actually spend about half the time in the day actually coding. Um, and the other time is probably figuring out how to code. Awesome, that sounds like quite a good split in your day though. Um, <laughs> wonderful. We'll move on to our last speaker then. So, uh, Buggy, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, now let me just get this in presentation mode. Right, I'm going to share my screen. Right, there we are. Okay. Right, so my name is Birgit Meldal, and I'm going to present it a bit back to front compared to the three earlier speakers. I think I'm also the oldest, so I won't be talking so much about my specific way into university because I think a lot of things have changed. Um, but I'm going to start off telling you what I do as a bioequator because it's probably a job you've not heard about before, and it's a job that didn't really exist when I left school. So I kind of I, I worked myself into it without even knowing what I was doing at the time. Um, right. Um, so a bio-curator is actually very similar to a curator who works in a museum or a librarian who look after specimens and artifacts and archive them, look after them and make sure they are preserved and they can be presented to the public where, uh, in a, in a precise manner. 
And what we do is biological data is we do exactly the same. We archive it and we provide it to everyone anywhere around the world. And all of the data we work with is in electronic format. So we're dealing with massive amounts of servers. We're talking peta and tetrabytes of data for all these different bits of data. So I work at the European Bioinformatics Institute and normally we'd be at this beautiful campus south of Cambridge, but of course, like most of you, we're all at home at the moment. Um, and this is possible because all of the stuff we're doing is uh, computer based. Um, so I'm going to give you a slight overview of what the sort of um, data is that we're working with. So everything that we work with somewhere starts with a genetic sequence. So in most cases, it's a bit of DNA. This might be a gene. This might be a bit of genome. This might be a whole genome, like a whole human genome. Um, in some cases, we start off with RNA. So like the coronaviruses, they are RNA viruses. And that's the code of life, as you know, my previous speakers already mentioned. But a lot of this DNA then codes for proteins. And these protein sequences, just like the DNA sequences, need to be deposited in databases. So they're archived and available for everyone at any time. And this is sort of work that's being done by scientists all the way around the world, and they can deposit that data in our databases. And then they need people like us to make sure they are in the right format so that you can compare it and work with it. And in particular, I work with protein data and protein function data. So proteins are the workhorses of the cell. Anything and everything that happens to make an organism alive relies on proteins, interacting with other proteins and often making complexes. And so precisely my job is to find the information about protein complexes in many, many other different databases and bringing it all together in what we call a complex portal, which is an encyclopedic database that links to other databases. So I'm a biologist. Um, I'm a molecular biologist that understand biology of the data and half my team are software developers. So I don't code like my previous speakers uh, you've just heard of, but I understand the basics of code. So like um, the previous speaker said, it's really, really handy to do some kind of coding um, training, especially now that everything becomes so um, electronically based. You don't necessarily have to know how to code deep down, but it's really good to understand what's happening so you can talk to software developers about your needs. And, and we constantly talk to each other. Um, every morning we have a stand up and, and we catch up on what's required. So that is what I do day to day. Um, I take care of the data and I make it available to everyone. Now, why do we do this? Um, we already sort of um, hinted towards it. Research is global. Everyone around the world needs to have access to the same kind of data. And if we didn't have decentralized databases, then the researchers in individual labs would have to do this work themselves. And lots of people do the same work independently of each other. And that's not really good use of resources. So there are centralized places like the EBI that provide this data for everyone. And so researchers actually deposit their data with us so we archive it and we keep it safe, just like a museum keeps artifacts safe. And at the same time, the researchers can take this data and amalgamate it with their results and come up with new questions each time they have a new result. So we, we had this, this huge data exchange, and you can see from the snapshot picture, this is the number of IP addresses, IP addresses that ping our databases at this particular second when the snapshot was done. The UBI website has got this, this um, interactive map that lights up every time there's a ping to our databases and it's like flashing lights all over. So that's what I do today. But how do I get there? How do I get to do a job that didn't actually exist when I left school, let alone when I was born? Um, so when I was little, my parents constantly took us to the local natural history museum. It was free, it was dry, it was interesting. I grew up in Northern Germany where it's raining quite a lot. Um, so I spent a lot of time there. 
And the museum is actually quite famous for its dinosaur exhibition. And whilst dinosaurs are cool and I didn't like looking at them, I was far more interested in that uh, exhibition about genetics. And we're talking 1980s here, so pre-human genome, um, and a lot of the technologies that we take for granted now weren't there. But there was this, this really simple computer animation that was showing the process of replication. And I found it absolutely fascinating how such a simple process can be just the basic of all life on Earth. So at that point, I decided I wanted to do biology for, my, for the rest of my life. There was never any question. So obviously I did all my school years and um, I went to school in Germany. So I did my Abitur, which is like a baccalaureate. Um, my two main subjects um, were biology and Latin. Uh, so like um, uh, one of the other girls said, it's really nice when you don't have to specialize at 16. I took 13 different subjects um, before I finished school. Now, the other big love of my life was swimming. And so I loved everything to do with water and everything to do with biology. So it was only natural that I would go and study marine biology. Now to study marine biology, I traveled a thousand miles northwest across Northern Europe um, to go to Bangor University in North Wales. And I have to say, I had the most fantastic three years there. It's a small city, kind of trapped between the Irish Sea and Snowdonia National Park. You have the most amazing beaches and, and natural reserves, marine reserves there, marine environments. And we just did lots and lots of field trips. And the degree itself was very ecology based, um, but in the third year I could take some genetics modules. And then my project, um, final year project was on the population genetics of Litorina saxatilis, which is this little snail that I've got on the picture here. Um, I also did some summer placements in labs uh, just to get an experience of what, what, what it was like to actually work as a researcher and decided that, yeah, that was what I was going to do. I want to be a biologist, so the natural next step was to do a PhD. And for that, I stayed with the theme of marine um, genetics. So I went to Southampton Oceanography Centre, which is the picture in the middle on the bottom and studied nematode genetics. The nematodes are model organism and they're looked at for all sorts of reasons from biodiversity to um, inferring the basic molecular mechanisms in the cell from worm to human because the basic mechanisms are very, very similar. Um, but there wasn't much known about the genetics of marine nematodes. We knew stuff about um, terrestrial nematodes and parasitic nematodes. These are by the way, these are tiny worms that live in every soil. So your garden soil, your seashore, anywhere. Um, these are also the worms that are causing um, infestation in pets, for example. So if you need to worm a pet, there will be some of those worms will be nematodes. And some of you may have been treated for worms as toddlers. Those are also nematodes. So they're everywhere around us, even if you can't see them. Um, so yes, and as part of this, I ended up working partially in the Natural History Museum in London. So from one museum in my childhood to another museum in my twenties, because I compare the genetics of these nematodes with the morphology, which is the study of how they look like. And so I worked with curators in the museum on these specimens. So one thing that I always wanted to do was, was close to helping people. And so the natural step for me now was, well, I got my PhD, which means you can call yourself doctor. And then um, I wanted to get into research, but I wanted to do something that's a little bit more close to humans. So I ended up working in a couple of different labs, um, researching cancer and virology. So we looked at the breast cancer gene that was uh, involved in yeah, a cancer genus and worked in breast cancer, ovarian cancer and testicular cancer. And we looked at the, the protein interactions and what trying to characterize this protein, which was actually quite difficult. Um, and then I spent five years in virology where I studied epidemiology of hepatitis B and a little bit of hepatitis E. And whilst lab work was really interesting and 
when it works, it's fantastic, but there are also lots of um, frustrations when you have to repeat experiments or sometimes boring stretches where you have hundreds of samples to process and all is just the same thing until you actually get a result. So when the funding ran out again, and this is something that sort of stays with you in research in most places, you have short term contracts and you go from one project to the next or you evolve the project to, to a new one. Um, you have these breaks and so one when the, this break came eight years ago I decided I really love working with data more than producing the data in the lab and that's when I became a curator at the EBI um, and I'm really enjoying it um, I have the feeling that I do service to more than just my colleagues um, because everyone around the world is able to use this data and like the other speakers, when the pandemic hit last year, our database also got COVID related data and we started to curate protein interaction and protein complex data. So in a very, very tiny level, hopefully we are contributing a little bit to understanding SARS, COVID, uh, SARS coronavirus to better so we can get the hang of this disease. So for me, what's next, I don't know yet because my time at EBI is coming to an end. And um, so I'm at a crossroads, just like many of you. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I'm available for questions. Ah. Awesome, thanks very much. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. There was a few comments sort of thanking you all for being yeah, here. Just, um, about about 10 minutes to, to sort of answer any questions. Um, I can stop your sharing there for you. There we go. Um, that we can take some questions um, either for any specific speaker or for uh, if you just want a, a sort of collection of answers. Um, so if anyone's got any other questions they've thought of, pop it in either the chat box or the Q&A. Um, there's been quite a lot of questions around like choosing university courses or choosing a university itself. Leah, I saw you had a really great answer uh, sort of in, in the, in the Q&A uh, sort of typing area. Um, so Leah, I wonder if you could sort of summarize that uh, for everybody else who maybe can't see that. Oh, is this the one about modules? Uh, yeah, so if someone, someone uh, I think you had a really nice answer about um, looking at the looking at the modules rather than worrying too much about the degree name. Yeah, don't worry about the degree name, right? So degrees with a different, the same name can be very different. I'm going to pick biochemistry as the example. In some unis, biochemistry is almost all organic chemistry and you barely go near any cells. In other degrees, biochemistry is all looking at cells and you never go near organic chemistry. Um, if you have some idea about which bits of your A-levels you found the most exciting and then have a look at kind of those that are connected, you, you know, ask around the internet and talk to the admissions tutor at unis. Um, but I reckon you'll get much closer to the degree you want if you look at what you're actually going to be doing. Awesome. Yeah, I think I definitely got bogged down in, in wanting a specific degree title. Um, both Hannah and I went to St Andrews and part of the reason I chose to go to a Scottish university was because for the first two years I could take chemistry, I could take physics, I could take astronomy because I liked space. Um, and so for me, that was a really important part of choosing my, like my university. Um, I don't know if either of the rest of you have any sort of top tips for picking either the university itself or, or like a degree specifically. Yeah, I agree. Like I did not choose St. Andrews because of this um, broad start, but in the end, it ended up being one of the parts that I really loved. The fact that I could, in my first year, I studied chemistry, biology and psychology, and it gave me a broad base and exposed me to different aspects. Um, I would also say think about the place because you're going to maybe live somewhere for three or four years. Um, and so, as I said, I grew up in a village and so I knew that I didn't think I could at that time handle a big city. And so I chose somewhere smaller that I thought um, I would just maybe feel more comfortable in. And so I think take that as part of your consideration. Um, it's like choosing yeah, uh, a next life step as well as uh, academic. Oh, could I add one more bit to that? Um, is that you could actually just pick a degree that you think you enjoy. I know people who did degrees as physicists and then became biologists later. Uh, it's more unusual to go from biologist to physicist than the other ways around, but like pick a science degree you like and a lot of the skills like designing experiments, doing looking at data, they like, they're transferable across all sciences. 
So you can do something different for a master's or PhD. So I, I don't worry about it too much. Yeah. Yeah, I would add to that. Uh, do you, even with, with the degree, but also with the job afterwards, do what you really enjoy because you need to want to go to the office, to the lectures. So, you know, it doesn't, if it's a drag, you've chosen the wrong thing. But there's nothing wrong with changing. Like, I can't remember, was it Harriet O'Hanna who changed a degree halfway through? It's the right thing to do when you realize you want to do something else. And don't, don't feel like it's a lost year. Because it's experience, it's all experience. And don't feel, I didn't say in my talk, don't feel like you have to go from your undergraduate straight into postgraduate degree either. I actually feel like I should have maybe done a year as a research assistant and learned how research works from the inside before I got thrown into doing my own. Yeah, I think that's all really, really good advice that at the end of the day, it's what you're going to spend three years doing. So if you don't think it sounds interesting on paper, it's not going to be an interesting thing for you to sit through. Um, and yeah, you're going to be living there probably for sort of three or four years. So if you don't think you like the place, then again, it might not be the sort of next best step for you. Um, just having a look through some of the other questions. Um, someone's asked whether you can go into a degree like biochemistry um, with a BTEC rather than sort of traditional um, A-levels. Um, Leah, I don't know if you've got any, uh, or anyone else has got any experience on, uh, or knows anyone who's gone into, into science maybe doing a BTEC route rather than an A-level route? I can probably answer some of that. So BTECs do carry UCAS points so you can go on and do degrees. There's also, if you want a more vocational approach, don't forget that there are apprenticeships. You can do degree apprenticeships. So you actually work and study at the same time. Um, and because it's an apprenticeship, you actually get paid a salary, an entry level salary, and you get a degree at the same time. So again, you know, don't, don't think that, you know, purely academic routes are, are the only way in. There are so many more opportunities to go in now. And, and don't think apprenticeships are just something that you do as a mechanic or a plumber. You know, there are, you know, lab degree um, apprenticeships in all sorts of areas. Bioinf there's bioinformatics degrees apprenticeships as well. Um, I saw there was a question earlier about are there undergraduates um, courses in bioinformatics that there's not that many specifically, um, but there are lots of master's courses. But equally, I know that Anglia Ruskin does a degree apprenticeships in bioinformatics. Um, so you know, that's certainly another route in as well. So don't forget about apprenticeships. Awesome. Um, and I think a nice sort of question that, a sort of two part question that might be nice to wrap us up. Um, so sort of what's the what's the one thing you value most about your job? Um, and then I guess what what sort of is the best skill that you've learned through, through your career as well? Um, and maybe we'll just sort of flick for everybody and that will probably uh, wrap us up. So I don't know if anyone wants to start. Oof. <laughs> big question the best skill I've got is trying to figure out how to solve a problem when it's not obvious why it doesn't work so that that kind of skill like it could be enzymes in a tube but actually today I was using the same skill to figure out my boiler started to flood right um so learning some of the problem solving skills in science I reckon they're useful everywhere um Um, following on from Leah, um, I feel like uh, same, like I've definitely improved my problem solving skills. I think another thing that I've improved a lot is my communication skills. Uh, you have to be able to communicate with both other scientists because it's such a collaborative field. And then also share your work with the broader community and general public. Um, and that's also linked to what I see as one of the best things about my job is that I get to work with lots of different people. I get to meet new people. Um, and it feels like a real community, the science community, which I really appreciate. And I think brings a lot of joy to my everyday work when I'm sat behind a computer. Wonderful, Harry or Birgit, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I'm just trying to think. I think the, the big thing about my sort of job is the flexibility. So you have, I, I I juggle many boards. So when I was in the in the lab, there was usually a focus on one project, and you dealt with individual pro problems uh, related to that project. But now, as a curator, you actually have loads and loads of roles. You have the role of um, 
um, help desk to deal with your users and their problems. Um, you, you're a trainer when you're teaching scientists on how to use your resources. Uh, we can do public engagement like this one. It's, it's um, optional. Um, and then you have to be able to work with lots of people with different backgrounds as well. So because the data science is, is so multidisciplinary, um, you have to start learning how to speak computer science, even if you don't do it yourself. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but it's, it's really interesting. And, and no, no day is the same. It's not like some of the lab days where you're just doing the same thing because you need to get through the set of samples and you spend a whole, whole week doing the same thing. It doesn't happen in, in my job now. Awesome, and Harry, I'll, uh, I'll let you uh, have, our, have our last input for, for the evening. Gosh, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, um, I would, um, I would come at it from, for me, coming at it from a technical point of view, um, the ability to code, I value more and more each day, especially knowing that technology is going to influence our lives and our worlds, hopefully for the better and looking forward. Also, I don't know what I'm going to do next, but it really reassures me that hopefully there'll be a way to input um, using those computer science skills. Being able to talk computer science, I agree, um, but problem solving has definitely been the main one. I'm a lot more patient with, with any problem um, from learning to break it down, going back to the root of the problem and then slowly working through it with, with your colleagues. Um, so rounding off with Hannah's communication input as well. I think there are some really um, viable traits. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for, for joining us this evening. And thank you uh, to our speakers for all uh, joining us this evening as well. Um, as I said, this is the last in our infectious disease series, but we will be starting a new series looking at human genetic variation in March. Um, I'm going to pop some links in the chat again, uh, things that you can look at in terms of learning resources, uh, how to get in contact with us, um, and a link to sign up to our education update newsletter. That's the best place to find out when our next series goes live. Um, there's also our email address if you have any further questions from this session or about the work we do in general, uh, do get in touch with us on that email. Um, but thank you very much uh, to our speakers and for everyone for coming and hopefully we'll see you for the next series. <laughs>